this off the ground before uh, we got the grant was that we went to our board and we said, you know, we want to do a show with 50 people in the audience. And they were like, no, you can't. Because, you know, that we, we just can't lose money on it. And we tried lots of other ways to sell it to them. You know, it's about bringing people in the building. It's about extending the experience. Blah, 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 blah. And none of that worked until we got the grant. And then we were able to sort of do what we wanted to do. But one of the things we thought about was we're not going to go out seeking scripts necessarily because we, we can't afford to pay a royalty and we just can't. So we decided to do our own and we had, again, we'd gone and seen a lot of things around the world and we thought, well, we'll just get a couple people in the basement and in my basement and um, see what we come up with. So we got a couple of actors and one of the key things in choosing these actors was that they were also theater instructors. <coughs> they knew how to work with children it wasn't just about performing because we devised a piece that actually got the children up on stage throughout, um, sorry, throughout the throughout the script. So it wasn't just about two people for 40 minutes performing. The kids again were given a bag of props. We chose bears because we thought you know kid three to five year olds like bears. Um, we chose the seasons as sort of a, a rough storyline, because again, we're looking for preschool concepts. And we built a show basically around that that had a lot of imagery, and in the end, um, dealt with the idea of empathy. So the last um, moment of the play, one of the bears is going to sleep, and the other bear uh, notices that she's cold, and he gives her his blanket. And then he's cold, and then the children in the audience who have blankets and give him their blanket. And it's really, it was really amazing to me. It wasn't about teaching empathy. It was about giving them a chance to express empathy. And for the parents, the parents, you know, these are kids who are nonverbal. Um, they have no language, many of them, because they're very young. And it was amazing for the parents to see that, have this moment with their children, and sort of all of a sudden see them as a, as a real person. <laughs> you know, with real thoughts and um, feelings. And so many parents said to us how incredible that was to have that experience with their child. But I mean, that, you have that happen when you, whenever a parent comes to the theater with a child, there's that sense of how is my child enjoying it? But this just up the ante on that, seeing the child actually get up and participate. And we had parents who were incredibly moved because they were watching their child watching the show. Um, the second piece that we created was Mouse on the Move, which uh, dealt with sort of the preschool idea of different modes of transport. But one thing we discovered um, from our European uh, friends was that the imagery in these plays is terribly important. So we upped our ante by bringing the set designer into the process from the get-go. And we said, we want this story to be about achieving images that the children can participate in creating, so we don't have pictures of them, but there's a, there's a, um, oh well, actually that's kind of one. Of them. There's these giant flowers that create the garden, um, and there's interaction with the children on that. And then these structures, um, there's a story about Ladybug, Ladybug, and how she's going away from home. Does anyone have a ladybug? And of course, they all have little clip ladybugs in their props bag, and they come up and decorate this leaf structure with to bring the ladybug home and to give her a new nest. So there's a, a very much a sort of that engagement that children are, are sweet enough that they truly believe the story cannot go on without them. Um, and again, that's a, a sort of beautiful thing for, for the parents, seeing them engage in that way. Um, we have really sort of felt and talked to our Head Start community, our teachers from Head Start come regularly to this work, and they see this kind of theater totally as a pre-literacy kind of engagement for children because you're essentially teaching the idea of symbolism. You know, in order to read, you need to recognize that that little letter A um, re represents a sound and that you put it together with PPLE, you get another sound that represents something else, which is something you can eat. And the whole idea of having the children recognize that the actor represents a mouse and that the, that image represents a flower that they would see in their garden only bigger. There's a lot of pre-literacy <coughs> things going on in their little minds while they watch the show. So it has tremendous educational value as well as being an artistic experience. Um, uh, I think the, the, the one I just showed, oh, you want to talk about the marketing thing? Yeah, yeah. so, 
you know, again, we were able to go back to our board and to our staff and talk about how theater for the very young is mission driven uh, rather than uh, money driven. Um, it does bring people into our building. Uh, we do have a cafe, we have a shop. Those are places that need to be populated. And um, it, it's, the really big thing for us was it extended our involvement with these, with these families. So instead of people bringing their children at seven and then aging out at you know, 10 and leaving us, they're coming in at one and staying until they're 10. And I know for people who do theater for adults, you guys can have people come for 20 years, but the good news for us is that they age out, and the bad news is for us is that they age out. So it is something that we, we, we have to really focus on. Um, and of course, building the, the, the habit of theater in young children and families is just you know, that idea of going to the theater. Kids, uh, I was just talking to Maureen at Arden Theater yesterday, and uh, she was saying to me, uh, you know, I don't know what to do with my two-year-old, you know? And so here we are with this opportunity for these families at 10 in the morning. They've been up since 5.30 um, <laughs> with their two-year-old, um, you know, waiting to, for, for, to do something. And so we've created that opportunity for them. And then, hopefully, it's a habit so that when they get older, they can then go on into our 400-seat theater, where then, at the age of four or five, it is appropriate for them to, to be there. Um, and then from a funding perspective, we found that um, for our, it's good for, been good for our development department to start to make relationships with these families earlier. And artistically, we found that, the, that we are free from the tyranny of the title for this age group, as long as you pick a, a mouse of there or under, you know, an appealing title for them. Um, we have not had to you know, try and get book titles or anything. Uh, because because they're desperate, as Kate said. Um, and the comment Kate mostly gets is, oh, I don't think you can come because my child really likes to, you know, won't sit still for it. And she says, great, we don't want to sit still for it. We want them to jump up and be a part of it. And, and that's it. We said to our, that when we introduced this kind of theater and the first group came in, it was like they'd met the iPad. They never knew they needed it, but the minute they saw it, they went, yes, I do need this in my life. Um, and uh, the next one is the numbers, is that right? Uh, I think actually you were going to talk about how oh, we do sort of kept oh, people right. with us. So, um, so then, once we got people to start coming to the show, we started sort of thinking again, how can we keep them with us? How can we keep them engaged? We have a very big education program at Imagination Stage, but our um, early childhood the, uh, part of that was not as uh, successful as we wanted it to be. So we started thinking, again, how can we marry what we see going on in the theater to what is going on in our education department? We sort of revamped our uh, education classes for that age group and made them mirror what was happening in the theater. So we created a brand new curriculum that was sensory based, um, which was what was going on in the theater. And we started doing a lot of grassroots um, work of going to every, you know, I went to every single show. and spoke to people afterwards and passing out flyers, you had a good time with your child here at the theater, wouldn't you like to extend that? One of the things that we found, because we, we also did surveys, where we went in and asked people, what are you looking for? And what we found was that people who had young children in early childhood were looking for something completely different than people who had children who were older. They were looking for flexibility. They were looking for one-off experiences. These were not things that we necessarily had in our education. So we really had to go back and be flexible and create those opportunities for parents. And when we did that, we found that things became um, a little bit more successful. These are two programs, one-off experiences that we created. Um, we had never done one-off experiences in any of our education program. But we found it, that people wanted it, and now they come. And every Sunday and, and Saturday morning, we are full to the brim. Um, with lots of young families in our building um, taking these classes. So this kind of shows you um, what's happened to this program. We went from doing Brother Bear in 2009 to needing five shows the following season to satisfy uh, the, the interest uh, in, in, from people in coming to, to, to attend this throughout the year and how the attendance has grown and um, how the budget has grown for it um, from 21 thousand in the first year to a, a, about a hundred thousand dollar piece. Now, as Kate said, that's not, you know, profit, it's money in, money out, but, 
And it's also a small part of our overall operation. We're a five million dollar organization, and there are you know a um, hundred thousand people coming to the building every year. So this is a relatively small group, but it's a group that we are building from the beginning, and a group that is having the opportunity to understand our aesthetic from an early age, so that in, in my dreams, by the time they grow up for the, the main stage, they are really much more sophisticated five-year-old theater goers than they would have been if they hadn't had these kinds of experiences when they were very, very small. Um, uh, this, this is the way that we managed to go from one to five in a year was by partnering with other companies. This is the Lingo Theater Company. They came over and laid this show Aquarium on our actors, and we paid them a royalty for the use of that. Um, and we've done it three, four. The other thing that happens we keep these things in rep so that it's not really that we're creating millions and millions of shows, but we're, we're able to do them kind of every year but in a different slot. And many people come back to see it more than once. Um, and then the new partnership uh, that Kate can talk about is with a company called Telltale Heart, which is also from India. We met a woman uh, in our travels a, a couple of years ago in uh, Copenhagen who runs a uh, theater called the Telltale Hearts, um, it's focused on preschool theater. But one of the things that was intriguing uh, about her work, uh, Natasha Holmes, is that she actually goes into nursery schools and does research. So if she decides that she's gonna write a play about play, how children play, she actually goes into a nursery school and watches how they play, and then develops devised material based on what she sees them doing. Um, and then the other aspect of her work is that her shows run 25 minutes, and then the last 10 minutes is a free play opportunity for the children to actually get up on stage and play with whatever. This show actually happens to be focused on boxes and cylinders, and there's about 100 shoe boxes um, in, the, in the room. And at the end of the show, um, they finish uh, their, their piece, and then they hand the boxes to the children and ask them to come up on stage and just play. Um, and so we brought her over. She laid that show on our actors, and we're going to go back into rehearsal with that and open that uh, next week. And also when she was here, we spent a week developing a new show uh, called Inside Out um, that's about clothing. And so I was able to go with her. We made arrangements to go to a nursery school in our neighborhood, and we brought in a big bag of clothing, and we talked about clothing, and we played with clothing, and we dressed up, and we watched the kids, um, what they did. Then we went away that afternoon, and we spent the afternoon devising three little pieces that we got directly from what the children were doing, and we took those back to the nursery school and, and showed them to them and got feedback from the kids. Um, and then we're sort of in the middle of writing that, and that will come uh, out next year. And then I just want to talk about sort of the future, where we see this kind of going for us. And uh, Kate's going to pass around, one of the things we did is we made an app out of Brother Bear. Um, so uh, you can, the ch we also have a book version of it uh, that we made that a lot of parents will pick up on an impulse fly so that they can relive the, the experience with their child at bedtime. Um, and we've, we've, uh, we're nearly finished with the book for Mouse on the Move too. And the, the app is just, you know, our, our attempt to get with the 21st century <laughs> and, uh, and keep everybody involved on that. But the other exciting piece um, is uh, research. Uh, Kate showed the show with the boxes. We're, we're starting some pilot data collection with uh, working with a researcher from the University of Maryland, uh, really trying to understand how, uh, what the child, the early, young child's brain is like on theater. And so we're going to have control groups where some kids will uh, have the opportunity to play with the boxes before they see the show, and we will be scoring them on how they interact with them. And then another group will see the show and then have the opportunity to play with the boxes, and we'll see how it's different. Um, we're also working with how different socioeconomic groups respond and if there's a demographic difference between uh, Head Start kids and uh, the Head Start kids. And who's funding the research? At the moment, nobody. But you have to have the pilot data in order to write the grant. But um, we're, you know, we're hopeful that uh, there's a, a brain scientist at Hopkins who's working with adults now, and we're going to try and get them interested in the real ones. So that's essentially it. Um, be very pleased to hear your experiences with theater for the very young or questions. Sort of a crass question. How do you? I'm thinking this. How you guys are 
Is this packaged at all into your membership options or your subscription options, or is it standing completely outside of those? Is it an opt-in? Um, um, it is. It is opt-in, and actually, we did not make it a subscription or even part of our subscription series because we found that we didn't have to. Cool. Because it, because we sell out almost every single performance. It's only a hundred people. Um, so when it comes to the time when we need to generate business for it we probably will create a subscription series, but we we're actually afraid to create a subscription uh -huh. series because we were afraid that then we would block people out that wanted to come. And also, people with young children, it's hard for them to commit, um, you know, and know that they're going to come on a certain day. You know, it's really, really hard. So right now, so far, it's been okay not to have to do that. Yeah, I think one of the things you observe was less commitment you ask for people to classes or the show, the more engaged, the more <laughs> happier they were. You know, yeah. Sorry, wrong. I know. So how many performances then did, did you do, say, a later show? Uh, you, we actually and do anywhere from eight to 10 a week. So yeah. we'll do two a day, Tuesday through Friday, and then two on Saturday and two on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we can we, you know book field trips and groups during the week, and then uh, and the set is such that it's struck every day. So that same space is used for classes and rehearsals in the evening, and the actors are paid to set it up in the morning. So it's in one of your rehearsal spaces? It's in the smaller theater on the stage. We actually oh, okay. we don't use the seats, we use the stage. Yeah. I'm a managing director. I really like the artistic and educational aspect of all of this a lot. But I do have to ask, what's the average ticket price? Oh, it's $10. $10? Yeah. But remember, you. They have to come with a parent, so right. really, yeah. you know, I mean, it's yes, it's it, we fit a hundred people in the in the theater, and uh, uh, it's ten dollars. How many weeks do you run? Yeah. We are doing five, sort of five a year, and it's about a month's run at a time. Um, in the summer, we don't have the space, so we just do weekends. But we felt that it was better to just do weekends and keep the group coming back than to just close over the summer. Um, yes. And we've also had the opportunity to tour with it. The, the, the other theaters in, in DC have been keen to have this work. The Atlas Theater, we do. We are connected to them, and they bring once they close. Once we close in Bethesda, we bring it down there, and that's a completely different area of DC. Um, and they have a huge population of young families. Um, I'm Tiffany with Lexington Children's Theater. And when you first started the program, did you market through your usual? channels or did you do something different to get this different audience to the theater? Well, we've done very little marketing for this. It has so sold itself through word of mouth. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a little, we, we did a little bit of a marketing campaign through the early childhood people who were already sort of taking classes with us. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of started there and then they started coming and then word of mouth and then we got a newspaper article and it was like, it's sort of like Janet said, people didn't know that they needed it until it was there, and then as soon as it was there, it kind of took off. But again, remember, it's people. It's just done a lot of people to, to fill the house. You know, it seems like it's really great. We love that feeling, but really, it's it's not a lot. So, so it's easy to fill. So, um, of the 100 people, how many actual young people are supposed to be no more than 50 little ones okay. sometimes you know granny comes along and then she yeah. sits in a seat at the, uh, on the side or at the back we try to provide some seats for people who don't want to be on the floor yeah. with their child um, but yeah sometimes the parent really has to advocate for the child if the child is shy and the parent really wants you know her to put her snow on the tree the parent will get up on the stage with her it's very it's very open you know it's not about the children having to participate on their their own it's very much a parent or caregiver child um, engagement together. We can take it. Some kids just want to sit there and watch. They don't want to do anything with the props. Do you sometimes have more than one child per parent? Yes. Mm -hmm. Two or three. Mm -hmm. Well, when we do the school groups, there can be you know very oh, yeah, few adults. Um, and when and you guys, sorry. No, when you guys made this transition, did you add production staff or did you restructure their time? Uh, we found that we needed a we have an apprentice program and they could step in to be we, br we bring in a, a separate stage manager who's a contract labor person to be the stage manager for the program 
And then sometimes we would need uh, we need usher support, and we need um, maybe an apprentice helping to make sure that everything happens smoothly. But we didn't hire additional staff. Um, it's just the I more. added it to my plate. Yeah, Kate, 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 Kate. but I but I had a passion for it. Yeah. So it was okay for me to do that. And and then we also took somebody from education. The great I think the most the greatest thing that happened from all of this is that. For years, we've been trying to get our theater and our education to cross over, and it's unbelievable how it just doesn't. <laughs> and so it just seems like incredible to me. I don't know why. Um, but so the fact that I was working on this, and then we had somebody from education working on this, and the fact that we worked together and really pushed our audience to cross over, they really have. And what my great hope is that that is going to continue. That you know, then that will happen in K1, and that will happen in grades two, three. Because we have a great education program, and they should continue, you know? Um, so that, that, was, that was a real thing. On your weekday shows, how much of it is a mix between groups coming and just in, in uh, I would say it's probably two-thirds field trips in groups, and then a third of stay-at-home mm -hmm. moms who, or mommy's groups. We have a lot of mm -hmm. uh, parent groups. Um, I think we should stop yeah, so that we can it over to get to Stacey. the Children's Theater. Thank you guys for coming. I was new to Minneapolis, and it was starting with the perception that we were, I lived in a, actually a relatively segregated city. You know, that populations didn't mix, they didn't collide. And so the idea was, how do we use the theater initially to become a common ground, a meeting place, a collision place, the way uh, I'm married to an Italian, and if you go to the Piazza del Duomo at night, people are there, they come there to argue and talk and meet, and you know, and in New York you bounce into each other. And that wasn't happening in the Twin Cities. So our initial thing was, how do we bring people together to play, to have accidental encounters, to collide, to mix? And so we began to create some programs. We created a thing called the Around Series, which isn't so different from what a lot of people did, but because we're theater for young people, it was about doing and being together and sharing activities. For example, I'll just tell a few quick examples. I could go on for days because we did some things I'm excited about. When we did a piece called The Beggar's Strike, which is a piece that took place in Senegal, we invited the area merchants, the African merchants, we live in a city with lots of African populations from many different countries, to take over the lobby after the show and create an African marketplace. So when we left the theater, suddenly there were vendors and performances and you know, we also helped the local economy. We turned our audience onto the fact that in this community are Somali, Liberian, you know, Eritrean, Ethiopian merchants food, etc. So that was really fun. And then several nights we had African dance parties. So the people would leave the theater and the whole audience is filled with people dancing. And one night I'll never forget, people wouldn't leave and the band didn't stop. <laughs> and we, we partnered with the museum next door and the security guys kept coming, you know, that's enough. That's <laughs> uh, but the band played on. Um, with another one, I'll just tell you quickly, with another uh, uh, piece, we did a piece called Korjak's Children which was inspired by the life and work of Dr. Janusz Korczak, who was a pediatrician and children's rights advocate in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and we spent about a year saying, how do we build community engagement? How do we talk about this play? And we came up with the idea of interfaith dialogues. And what that meant was we, we approached the leading a priest, it sounds like a joke, the priest, the rabbi, and the nun. No, but uh, you know, imams, priests, uh, 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 rabbis, etc., and ask them, and this, it was literally like making peace in Vietnam. It was a very complicated series of things. We asked them all to bring their congregations to a specific performance, and then we had a facilitated conversation. And, you know, in your life you get to do certain things that make you really proud. This was one of those days where, this piece is a very tough piece. You know, you the piece ends in a tragic moment where this inspirational leader is guiding his young people in the uh, only possible journey they can do, which is they're forced to go to Treblinka, which is the facts. So the facilitator asked each of us to turn to our neighbor and introduce ourselves and say something about this piece. Then the four uh, religious leaders got up 
and talked about what this peace meant to them. And they shared unbelievably personal stories that their congregations had never heard. And then we turned to each other and had a, con a conversation in the space. And I'll never forget the first question. This gentleman put his hand up and he said, where is God in this play? And then that spurred a whole set of conversations about the God in people and the spirit and what Korjak meant. And it accomplished what we wanted, which was suddenly the theater was a, a, a motor to bring people together and to have a real conversation, and the theater was a motive for that. Uh, and one last one uh, I'll tell you, which is we did a piece called Lost Boys of the Sudan. And, uh, and our team council, and I'll, I'll go into the team council in just a second, came up with this idea, which was, I found out that there was a Sudanese refugee who had created a whole traveling exhibit of art of the uh, refugees, rather remarkable work. So we contacted this gentleman, got him to raised a little bit of money from some people in the human rights committees and got him to fly out with this show. But then our teenagers had an idea, which I didn't get at all at first. In fact, I was like the giant idiot <laughs> naysayer. And they said, why don't you put this collection before it gets here online and have teenage artists in the Twin Cities respond to this work? I was like, that's kind of confusing. But they, they said, oh, shut up. And so, um, <laughs> so I shut up finally. And so what happened became one of this incredible way of engaging your audience where we put out a call for teenage artists. We put this online. They saw the work of the Sudanese refugees. And then all these kids made work. They made amazing work. Two-dimensional, video, three-dimensional, you know, all kinds of work. And so we had a joint opening and a joint show of these 15 to 18-year-old Twin Cities artists and these guys from the Sudan. And having them hang out together, look at each other's work as we opened the show was way cool. And having both of them have their work together um, so, lots more stories like that. These were all good and strong projects, but they became kind of one-offs. And they didn't do something that we wanted to do, which was build ongoing relationships with community. Find a way to embed ourselves in an ongoing way with um, our community and truly engage. So, and so we started to create some other words that were important to us, like words like autonomy, respect, critical inquiry, real dialogue, create partners. Um, and so we wanted to create what I would call sort of a deeper sense of wealth and a deeper sense of engagement. Um, we were very fortunate in that we received a grant from the EMC Arts for that innovation lab. And so we put together a team that was really exciting for us. We had a brilliant elementary school teacher. Um, we had a community activist an IBM strategist. We had a board member who was the executive from Best Buy who created customer centricity, which is all about saying, instead of this Best Buy being about the guys, the 22-year-old guys who know everything about tech, it's actually about you. You know, so that he sort of revamped Best Buy. Uh, and a member of our team council, a 17-year-old kid, and our director of new play development, managing director, HR director, and myself. The process was kind of revelatory. And it was actually led by both the guy from Best Buy and the school teacher. We put kids in the center of this circle. We did this, you know, like a little whiteboard thing. We put kids in the center of the circle. And we said, who actually encounters kids? Who actually has the most contact with kids in our organization? And then it was so wild for us. Because then we said, well, the people who have the most contact are the ushers. <laughs> and then the people are the house managers. And then the box office staff. And then... The artists were way out in Neptune, way out in Pluto, and I was in Gonzo Gonzo Land. You know? And so it was like, oh my God, oh my God, the creative teams, and we have wonderful creative teams, have the least contact with kids than anybody. The people with the most contact are ushers. And we said, okay, well that model's broken, so how do we fix it? And we took inspiration from um, this teacher. And out of this conversation came the following question. How can we change our relationship to young people themselves to make better art? So we said, our goal is to make great art. That's why we exist. And so how do we change our relationship with young people to make great art? So, um, and if we made them not you know, the object of our work, but the subject of our work, if we, and so then we switched from the notion of them as the receivers of our product to co-creators with us, to equal co-creators. Um, and we spent days and weeks working on this. And the um, 
Out of that came a program we call Kid Centricity, stolen from Best Buy. But they don't sense, <laughs> uh, because they're about to go under, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, I didn't say that. Uh, so the way it works is we work with a couple teachers, and what these teachers do in advance. For example, I'll tell you two stories. We've done this on two projects. We're in the middle of one. We finished one. We started with Mulan. Okay? And what they did is they prepped the kids. Okay? They prepped the kids. So the first week of school, these kids were reading uh, the poem, the, the story, looking at Chinese art, Chinese history. They probably did look at the Disney film. Um, they looked at the script and had huge issues with it, which was fantastic. Um, and then we brought them to see a show in our theater. We gave them a tour. We had them meet every single shop head. Okay? They went to every single shop. And this began the transformation. We had them have a tour so that they would know the tools we have to offer. We have a trap setup. We have a fly house. We have a wig master. We have a prop shop. We have all these things. These are the tools you have to play with as a co-creator. These kids are what age? They're first to fifth grade. First to fifth grade. Um, uh, so they came and they saw everything. And what I was going to say is that's where the transformation started. Our, our theater, most of our, most of our shop heads are women. Okay? So you have a little girl come in, and you have our TD saying, you know, I'm in charge, and all of her carpenters are men. And so here's this woman in charge of building all our scenery, and she starts to tell the story about um, how she began. And one of the things she says is, you know, when I was little, I, uh, I played a lot. I like to play with Legos. And this girl goes, I play with Legos. I could do your job. <laughs> and what happened later is the teacher said, this little girl never stopped talking about it. That she could build scenery because she played with Legos. And that's, on one hand, it sounds silly, but on the other hand, it's incredible. One of the other kids, you know, we all, we're all, we, a lot of us make theater for young people who are in this room, so we all have these miracle stories, so pardon me. But, you know, there was one kid that had never spoken in this class. And he sat with our light board operator, and the guy said, you know, this is what I do. And, you know, he showed him, and he said, here, take over. And so he's doing this, and the 